Today, I am speaking with Alexa Vartman, founder of the New Tantra, which is one of the biggest tantric organizations in the world. She retired several years ago. Um, there have been a lot of positive articles in the past on your work. There have also been some negative articles uh, more recently. You have not responded to those in the past, but um, so why have you decided to respond now? Hmm. For me, I don't really care if an ex-employee, disgruntled ex-employee, writes something that's you know, lying and not true about us. I think it kind of goes with the job of being you know, a kind of public person. And in the past, it hasn't it, uh, reduced our sales. In fact, a little bit of controversy has actually increased our sales. It gets people you know, curious. So I haven't responded, also because I think it's a little bit distasteful. I was brought up that you, know, you don't initiate attacks on somebody. Um, I mean, I could complain about some of my ex-teachers and things, but I think that's just really unnecessary to do that. So I've kind of just tried to stay away from it. But the problem is that recently a major Dutch newspaper, Volkskrant, read online blogs and articles and started quoting them as if they're evidence, as if they're true, as if they've been researched and properly um, written. And now I'm sort of backed into a corner where the lawyers tell me, like, you have to respond. Otherwise, you know, you're a sitting duck for any other newspaper in the future that decides to do a scandalous article. Um, we're, we're very easy to point fingers at. So I've been told, you know, it's time to respond now. The, there's a, also a second reason why I wanted to respond, and that is that it's a, a wider perspective, that this seems to potentially affect more than just, you know, some weirdo guy wearing a dress, you know, from some tantric organization. It, it can affect all of us. And that's where I feel we have to be a little bit careful. Times have changed. In the past, if someone slandered you, said something bad about you and your village, it kind of stayed within the village. And if you didn't like it, you could move away. And over time, you know, those rumors and gossiping would disappear. The problem with social media and the internet is anyone can write anything scandalous, untrue, slander someone, and it stays on the internet. It stays on the internet forever. It's very difficult to get these things removed from Google. And it's also very difficult to get any compensation in the EU from a newspaper or someone that does do defamation of character, slander or libel, there is no real compensation. Now, I think that needs to change. For example, in the US, you know, they have huge claims, maybe not that big, but maybe more like the UK where they really think carefully about doing a witch hunt on someone where they, they can't just scandalously make up lies about someone. We have responded to Volkskran a lot, given them a lot of information, 90% they didn't correct. And what's my recourse? The only recourse really is to fight fire with fire, produce a video, and then let people decide. Hear both sides of the story, make up their own mind. The problem is if the long-term effect of this is that it does make people be afraid to be successful. In Sweden, they have something called Jantelagen. Denmark, Jantelöven, I think it's called. In Australia, we call it tall poppy syndrome. In Denmark, I think you say the tall trees get hit by the most wind or something. How does that go? In Dutch, it's hoge bomen vangen veel wind. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it's, it is getting more and more dangerous to stand out and be successful these days. If, the, if we can prove, for example, that everything in this article is totally wrong, what do they do? They just give you know, a few lines on page 13. Yes, we apologize. There was inaccuracies in this article. No one notices it. They're more in, they've listened, they're more interested in all the scandalous thing. Like we have you know, 10 very positive articles on us, only two negative. People you know, are viewing those. So what is the recourse? This is where we're looking at it. Let's get back to the Volkskrant article. What happened there? It's very interesting to know a little bit more about this Volkskrant thing. Back in 2013, we invited a journalist to come in and participate in the workshop and do a, a reportage, an article on it. Yeah, I read it. Right, and it was you know, fairly positive. We got a huge amount of sign-ups from that. 
And now Volkswagen years later is reporting on the same period when I was facilitating workshops and all of a sudden it's doom and gloom and terrible and force this and force that. Where was that before? It kind of ra raises suspicions about what is the motive behind this sensational article. Now I understand that the readership of Volkswagen is going down and they may need, to, but do they need to stoop to this, you know, witch hunting of very biased journalism where they're using, quoting, you know, a few anonymous sources. They gave us, you know, 72 hours to respond to this, you know, when we're you know, on holiday and all of a sudden we have to, you know, how do you answer fictitious names in an article? They're so biased. It's a handful of people that didn't have good experiences with other workshops. They don't mention the 5,000 so people that have been through our workshops that have been very, very happy with it. It's completely biased journalism. When a newspaper prints things like this, the burden of proof lies on them to give evidence. We asked Volkskrant, please supply the sound clips of the people that you interviewed, completely ignored. 90% of what we sent back as corrections, they ignored. They only put in what the worst accusations they had to take out. We asked them, you know, they said, what's your response? And we gave them a very short response to print. They didn't even print that. It makes you question, what is the motive? This is like really nasty journalism. And this is a clear example of biased reporting where they're not giving both sides of the story, where it's basically turned into a witch hunt. I mean, shame on Volkskrant for doing this. I mean, Irene de Schwann, Anna Kostoflin, we were going to report you to the Journalist Association, Rad Vor, the journalist. You know, <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. For this, this is not okay that you go after people like this. You know, I understand the readership's going down, but to, to resort to scandalous stories like this is not okay. I read the, the negative stories on you, and there were some pretty disturbing things in there. Uh, you've been accused of uh, being a cult leader, forcing people to do things against their will. What do you have to say about these allegations? A lot of these allegations in the newspapers, they're talking about things that happened in the past. I've been out of TNT for several years now, but they're still referring to as if I was there. You know, things have changed, things have evolved since I left. One of the, you know, the, a cheap shot is not you're a cult leader. Anyone who's different, you know, and has a, a group of people that seem to like them a lot, they get labeled as cult leader. It's a, you know. The funny thing is that we had one of the senior uh, people from the International Cultic Studies Association come and actually do um, several of our workshops. And at the end of the workshop, he came up and shook my hand and said, look, I just want you to know that, you know, this is so non-cultic. You are really encouraging people to have power to say no, and you keep checking that all along. And that's why, you know, this whole thing of forced people, we're forcing people to do things against their will is kind of ludicrous to anyone that goes into our workshops and sees how we run them. We're very, very big on empowering people to say no. In fact, in our, uh, one of the exercises in the workshops now is to get people to exercise saying no. We, ha we have it in the workshop agreement that they can at any time say apple tree, which is a code word we use to completely stop the workshop. That they're not comfortable with something. We encourage them to challenge the workshop facilitator. If they don't like what they're doing, we ask them at the beginning of every exercise, are you comfortable with this? What about you monogamous couples that only want to work together? They can modify things, they can put their boundaries whatever way they like. We don't want people to be uncomfortable. It is bad for business. So the forced thing is really just to get people's fear up, like, oh, they're forcing people to do stuff. It doesn't really logically make sense. One of the strange things that they do in the articles, they talk as if I'm still involved with TNT, you know, facilitating workshops or pulling strings behind the scene. I mean, when I retired, it was just like, I, you know, I just want to step back from this. I don't want to be, you know, the head guy, but also to create a flat, no hierarchy structure that the team all has one vote and they decide the direction they want to go themselves. They can consult me and ask for my opinion, which I then have one vote. 
but in generally I've let them you know, be empowered to make their own decisions. Also in the workshops, I haven't facilitated for years. Again, it's a much more sustainable way to have men and women teaching side by side. So if all of that is true, then why is TNT so controversial? Yeah, it's, TNT is, is challenging established norms in society, especially sexually. People very much focus on the sexual level, the sexual content. Mm -hmm. It's scary for them. And we are, you know, I firmly believe, as I mentioned earlier, that sex between consenting adults is a normal, natural, healthy thing. People should not be ashamed of that. And TNT is one place that you can go that you'll never get shamed for your sexuality. Let me give you a few examples of this. Yes, please. A lot of women, we find, you know, when we ask them, you know, masturbate, fantasize, or even watch lesbian porn. A lot of women are bi-curious. In our workshops, that's, you know, we don't care if you're gay, straight, transgender, what your sexuality preference is. We're not going to shame you, especially not women, because women have been shamed so long for their sexuality. You can come to a workshop, and if you, you know, want to explore you know, kissing and making out with a girl or being sexual with another woman, fine. It's, <laughs> in our world, it's totally normal. In fact, we've hardly ever had women that don't in, in, interact with other women. Another thing we were not going to shame women is around their uh, more slutty side. To us, there is a divine slut, and it is not a slanderous word to call a woman a slut in our workshops. Right. For example, a lot of women are masturbating to having more than one man, maybe two men, or you know, five men, or whatever they want. You know, there can also be a legitimate place for that. That doesn't have to mean that that woman is wrong and should be shamed for that. We also don't shame men. We spoke about that anus can be a part of healthy sexuality for men as well yeah. as women if they want. Um, but also with the, you know, with the penis, a lot of guys don't have a problem with penis. In fact, they, you know, they watch it in porn and it's part of the sexual act but they may, don't want to maybe attach to a, a man's body, but on, attach to a female body, it maybe changes the context of it. We don't care what people do, we don't judge. And I think that is the definition of love. Mm. Why do you say the article was based on biased reports? It's very difficult when you have something written about you that's you know, second, third, fourth person anonymously with fictitious names. For example, and I don't like to talk badly about people, I think it's kind of distasteful, but when you're backed into a corner and the journalists paint an unfair picture of people and quote them as if they're reliable sources, then I'm left with no other alternative. Yeah, fair enough. So for example, with Lily, you know, her real name is Yana <laughs> They painted her as this you know, pure, innocent little girl that was taken out of a workshop and that I preyed upon. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. What Volkskrant didn't disclose, you know, until we had to correct them, is that she was girlfriend with this guy they call Thomas, that's Eric Walrat, who was a member, who was an organizer of the workshops. In fact, he did the most number of workshops with us, 103 workshops over five or more years. He then wanted to have her as a girlfriend. And what we do in the new Tantra is that we are openly sexual in the team. I mean, we're a Tantra school. We have to practice what we preach. So it would be strange to have someone's partner there that's not allowed, who has to sit in the corner and watch. So we have that rule, you know, one of the few exceptions to these self-imposed rules that I put on myself and the other facilitators, that they, we could allow it to include their partner. So that was not mentioned. Volkskran also paints this picture as if I wanted to have sex with Lily. I mean, it's... <laughs> Eric Walrat asked me, begged me three times to give a free session to his girlfriend so that she could learn how to tantrically orgasm. And I reluctantly said, okay, that's how we knew exactly who it was when they changed her name. We knew exactly who it was because there's, there's, there's very few exceptions to our self-imposed rules. They then paint this picture that I'm deciding, no, the whole team 
gets together and says, okay, you know, is this person a suitable partner for you? Can we break our own rules that you can then have a relationship with this person? You know, Eric and Jana, can they have a relationship? And we feel, yes, they seem to be a good couple. We think they fit well together. Okay, and the team says, yes, okay. That's how we decide things, by democratic vote. And they spin it, and I'm somehow just hiding behind the scenes, you know, preying on these women. I mean, it's kind of ludicrous when you know a little bit more about the story. I'm very wary of women making up accusations. That's why I recorded her giving full consent to a fully sexual session. We, you know, later she says, oh, I didn't enjoy it. I hated it. It was too rough. Hello, according to her roommate, even months after she said she had a very positive experience from that. Proof's in the pudding. She even came back twice for seconds. We've got the recording of her moaning and groaning, clearly having fun. It's just taking a situation and twisting it into a very negative perspective. They also paint this lily white <laughs> picture of Yano as if she's this pure, innocent person that she had never taken drugs before. According to her flatmate, there was a box of drugs in the living room, hard drugs that they were using. None of this is mentioned in their article. Yana also blames me that I was somehow energy vampire sucking energy from her. <laughs> I mean, you know, she was already, according to her flatmate, on sick leave from bookings.com before she even came to the workshops. But I get blamed for that as well. The other person they mention in the article is Thomas, whose real name is Eric Walrat. Eric Walrat has seemed to dedicate his life to you know, opposing and trying to bring down the new Tantra. The inside story on that is that Eric was our organizer. And when I decided to retire, he started saying to the team, I'm the senior person, I've been here longest, I'm going to take over as the head role. He wanted this hierarchical structure, and that's exactly the, one of the main reasons I left and retired, is to move to a flat structure. It's, of course, Eric wanted to be the king of the castle, get most of the money, most of the power and the adulation. That is exactly what I wanted to get away from. When the rest of the team said, no, we don't want to work with him because he seems to be coming from a big ego, he got really pissed off, tried to start his own school, did one course that hardly got anyone to come along to, and then he's just angry at us. And this is what I say with the haters. If they can't create something new for themselves, they try and get famous by opposing someone that is famous. Eric was also not so smart to create a video, a webinar, where he accused me of having mental health issues. I had that video. It is a slam dunk case of libel that I could use against him. You cannot say your opinion because you read a book that seems to match what you think and then quote anonymous therapist friend that won't stand up for it. I've never done a psych evaluation with that anonymous therapist. You can't just anonymously accuse people of things. In fact, Eric spoke openly in a workshop several times to a lot of eyewitnesses that he had smoked crack, gone into psychosis, and was admitted into a mental asylum for six months in Sweden. So here's someone with mental health issues accusing me that's never had any mental health issues, and pointing the finger. I mean, use your logical mind. What's going on here? And you know, this is someone who has hacked into our website, changed our passwords, tried to lock us out of all our email servers. I mean, you know, this is not a nice person to be quoting as a reliable source in your articles. The other person that they speak about a lot in the Volkswagen article is Bea Dominic. Her real right. name is Beatrice Svedberg or Bea Karenstotta. Um, she was one of our head teachers teaching our lower sexual levels. And when I retired, she wanted to take over the higher levels as well and keep this hierarchical structure where she would be the head person taking over, getting the money and so on. 
And that's exactly the structure that I wanted to move away from. She got very pissed off because of that. One of the things she accuses me in, in her little article is that I was against her being monogamous. I've always said monogamy is by far the best way to go deep with someone. Of course, sex with someone that you love is much better than just sex with changing people. You can't go deep if you're constantly changing your partner. The new Tantra is totally for monogamy, love-based monogamy, if that works for them. What I am against, though, is when people use fear-based or control-based monogamy to control their partner. Right. I mean, that's not the definition of love in my world. We don't tell our best friends who they should sleep with and who they shouldn't sleep with. Of course, if you're in love with that person, you know, you don't want to keep changing. But what after a few years? If you want to include, the woman wants to include another woman in her bed or another man. That's why we have these recommendations, they're not forces, recommendations of if you want to be exploring with other people, invite them into your bed, allow them into your bed. So we're totally not against monogamy, but we're also looking for workable solutions to this problem of how do you deal when you're attracted to other people. And that's where I am against be a Dominic. But the not so smart thing is, both Eric and Bea, if they're making accusations of wrongdoing, they are self-implying, self-implicating themselves in that process as being the organizers. It's not very smart. Because they were the organizers during the time. They were the organizers during that time. If they say there's something wrong that happened or illegal, they're accountable. It doesn't make sense. I mean, this is a dangerous time to be a workshop leader or involved with Tantra. B. Schofield wrote a very negative article on us. We had that removed from medium.com because it was so completely one-sided. She's systematically going through like 20 organizations trying to get them removed. I mean, how you know, reliable is that? Apparently, she was informed to go after TNT because her astrologer told her so. I mean... <laughs> where does this end? You know, where does this come from? Ido in the Volkskran article was mentioned. His real name is Eva. <laughs> he blames us, TNT, for breaking up his relationship. Apparently, he, you know, we have emails from him where he said that his relationship was already on very, very rocky on the verge of breakup and that he hoped that somehow the new Tantra would fix his relationship. No, we never make promises like that. Where's the responsibility to themselves? They also blamed us for making them polyamorous. No, we have evidence that they were in the swingers community before they came to the new Tantra. You know, to me, it's, you know, it's a little distasteful to say anything negative about anyone. But again, I'm being forced into a corner to do this. Really, this is about 5% of the dirt that I have on these people. If people knew really behind the scenes what these people would be doing, it would be shocking. It would be career destroying for them. I don't want to say more now, but if they keep attacking me, then I will keep revealing more. I will not just lay down and be steamrolled by these people. It's basically just cyberbullying, and it's not okay. So I don't want to be rude, but the obvious question most people want to ask right now is why are you sitting here in a dress <laughs> yeah i guess we should have maybe addressed that one first um the, the reason i sit here in a dress is i try and stand for that which people cannot stand for in themselves i think that sex between consenting or healthy adults normal sexual it, it's a normal natural thing between people and they shouldn't be ashamed of it the same with for example men's feminine side, women's masculine side. It's perfectly fine for women to wear men's clothes. But before the Second World War, it wasn't okay for women to wear pants and men's clothes. It was only when Coco Chanel started designing suits and pants for women that it became socially acceptable to wear men's clothes. And now nearly most women wear men's clothes. 
You go into business, the woman wears a nice business suit, looks great. But a man walking into a boardroom meeting wear a dress, I mean, he'd be laughed out of there. You know, maybe men are, you know, 70 years behind the women's revolution on this. Um, so that's why you know, I, I am not ashamed of my feminine side. And I also don't think men should be ashamed also sexually if they also want to be in a submissive position. Sexually, I am what's called a bottom. I am the submissive. I'm not very interested in being the top. That's also um, why I wear a dress. Because also we've found that one of the keys to doing good tantric practices is to be able to move energy through the body and not get it stuck in one place. And that is through relaxing the anus muscles. So there's a lot of taboo in that. And that's why I'm saying, why do men have to hide in shame that they perhaps want to be submissive sometimes. We find it makes the man a better lover to understand how it is to be in that feminine position, to be receptive, um, but also to recharge batteries. You know, if you're always on top doing the push-ups, you know, it kind of, you can only last so long. Um, you know, sometimes you need to you know, perhaps lie on your back. It doesn't mean you need to wear a dress, but to be in the surrendered position and taken. So that's one thing that I clearly want to, would like to change in society, that it's okay for men to be submissive. The second reason I wear a dress is more personal reason, it's probably the main reason, is it's advertising, you know, who I'm interested in. You know, I'm not very interested in women, I'm interested in men. I'm not interested in submissive men, I'm interested in the top. So, you know, if there's any successful uh, guys out there that are, you know, mature guys that are confident in their sexuality, that they could be seen out with a heterosex, with a, with a uh, transgendered person. A lot of men want to have sex with me behind closed doors. You know, about the majority, about 67% of straight men, and I only really have sex with straight men, because if I, you know, that people say, oh, maybe they're gay if they have sex with you. No, if they're gay, they're attracted to the male body. You know, they want the feminine body. They're just not afraid of the penis, or they're even quite like the penis. We often say in our workshops, you know, guys, if you could suck your own dick, would you suck your own dick? And most guys say, oh, yeah. You know, so men don't have so much a problem with the penis. They just want it on a feminine form, for example. And that's why this whole transgender movement is becoming perhaps more and more interesting, more acceptable. And that's the other reason, is to you know, advertise who I'm interested in. You know, I'm not interested in you know, chasing women um, because to me, that takes a lot of work. Uh, it doesn't interest me. What interests me, I mean, you know, I think the only per woman that I'd perhaps be interested in is, you know, if I look in the past, the women I have had good relationships with are women that are, you know, that I can kind of look up to in some way. Perhaps they're older women, like, you know, Johan Erting and me. They're successful. They're perhaps, you know, um, very good in their field that I can, or we can work things out together. That's kind of interesting, but, I think, you know, one of the few women that I would be interested in if she called me up is, uh, what's her name, Sarah uh, Sigmund's daughter, you know, this CrossFit woman with the abs and the, I mean, imagine her topping me, I mean, that would be kind of quite sexy. That's so, uh, you know, that's why I wear a dress, to advertise that's who I'm also interested in. So, on a personal note, you have retired out of the spotlights, but how is the team doing? I think the team in general is, is doing very well. I think they've improved the new Tantra from the start up to this next phase. I think it's more sustainable having a democratic flat structure where each team member gets one vote. To have men and women facilitating workshops together is more sustainable. And I think that we've got a lot better at filtering out and getting very clear on who our target audience is, getting clear to make sure that people really, really clearly uh, know that they cannot come to our workshops if they have mental health issues, that they're screened out. That, I think, has made a big difference. On a personal note, I think there's a bit of a difference between the men and the women in the team, how they're responding personally. The men seem to have a little more distance from the situation. Like myself, I kind of see it. It's part of being you know, out in the spotlight, you're going to get some flack, you're going to get lies and accusations made against you. It's part and parcel with the job. I think for the women, though, it's, it's a little bit hitting them a little more. 
They, right. they seem to get a little bit more sad from it. So you see, you know the inside story that we've been trying to help people. You know in these people that have you know, turned against us and just completely fabricated their stories and seeing everything from a completely negative perspective where before they were seeing it from a positive perspective. I think it does make you lose a little bit of faith in humanity when you see how people can change and the damage people can do through slander and hearsay. I also think it's a little sad when you see how much good TNT has done that 5,000 people have been through the workshops, very positive experience. They're saying, it's changed my life. I have a so much better sex life now. Wow, wow, wow. And then a handful of disgruntled, angry people, the haters, can turn it and twist it around. It's also a little bit sad, I think. We're almost at the end of this video. What do you hope to get out of this? I think serious reform has to happen in the European legal system. There must be commensurate compensation for victims of slander that it makes it scary for media like Volkskrant to print these articles. Because the other change I would like to see is in, for example, the search engines like Google. You know, they're obviously making a lot of money. Maybe they should take a tiny proportion of that money and have a little committee that if someone writes a slanderous article, the burden of proof in, on them is to prove with evidence that that is true. And if someone challenges that and says, no, this is not true, they should maybe have a little committee and say, okay, they haven't provided any proof, then we will allow you know, Google to forget. Because right now, anyone makes up any story and it stays on Google forever. That needs to be changed. The good news is, that change can happen if there is a groundswell movement against things. If people say, yes, this is an important issue, let's talk about this. I know this from fact, when I was dating a quite famous woman in, in Denmark called Johan Erting, we had a relationship with her husband's approval, which was <laughs> made a lot of media attention. And when they incorrectly reported on her, you know, she got the media to self-regulate and bring in changes that they had to be more stringent on providing evidence for claims. So things can change if there is enough awareness on these things. I in believe in the inherent good of goodness of people. You see children are inherently good unless they're, until they're damaged. I think there is a goodness in people. We do want to be fair. And maybe it's just an unconscious thing that people are unaware of this situation that's coming up from two strong powers through social media, through the ability to slander people and have it recorded indefinitely. The other good news coming out is uh, that if you're too afraid to attend a workshop where it can be quite scary and confronting for a lot of people, the sexual teachings will come out in, in my next book, which will be coming out in the new year. So you can read about it, learn of this, apply it in your relationship, without being so confronting and scary. So that's some more good news. But on the whole, thanks for talking to me and thanks for watching. Thank you. If you like this video, if you'd like to support it anyway, please share it on your Facebook wall. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everything this weirdo is saying, but it's hopefully an interesting perspective on the current state of affairs of media and things that may threaten us all in the future which is creating enemies and the damage they can do through spreading lies about us. And stay tuned, there's some interesting talks on the way with Alexander Bard, a very famous and well-respected Swedish philosopher and a lot of other things. We're going to be doing some interesting talks on these sort of subjects in the future. So stay tuned, some interesting stuff coming your way.